Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, CSIS, for having me here today. I am simply here as a concerned citizen. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about my experience over the last 12 years of doing on-the-ground due diligence in China. What we have found are the two Chinas, I like to call it. The people of China who are open to us, supportive of us, honest in helping us do the right things. And the government of China and the corporations of China. And these are our experiences, only some of them. We've exposed over a dozen China-based frauds delisting $15 billion worth of market cap just from my firm alone as a part of a greater, yet untold, multi-billion, hundred billion dollar fraud in progress being perpetrated on financial markets all over the world. And we understand that the fraud that we catch is nowhere near the fraud in total. And I always feel it's important to point out that it's not illegal in China to steal from an American citizen. So we have $1.4 trillion in market cap here now today, which has grown by about a trillion dollars since 2008, and none of the China-based CEOs are legally accountable in the countries in which they live. So the fraud continues. Our first China fraud, one of the first China frauds that we exposed, cost us $300 in due diligence. We spent $300. It was about an $800 million market cap company. And about two hours after we released our findings, they crashed. A investment bank had the same due diligence we had three months prior to us and chose not to expose it, bury it, and raise $90 million from U.S. investors one month prior to us exposing that. Those investors were wiped out. We have on multiple occasions found China-based CEOs just one day disappear. We ask, where are they? Did somebody call the police? They say, who do you think took them? When are they going to be back? Maybe 30 days, maybe 60 days, maybe 90 days. You'll hear something. But that happens in China. CEOs can be just picked up and taken, and you don't hear back from them for some time. We have been sued several times for hundreds of millions of dollars defending our right to free speech by U.S. law firms. Yeah, there's always a U.S. law firm involved. You can bet on that. And that's, that's really what happens here, right? Our court systems are just, and they're taken advantage of. Our free press is just, and it's taken advantage of. And there's always a lawyer willing to help here in the United States. And the companies that have sued us all lost. And were delisted, went bankrupt, investors are wiped out. I have been hacked and subject to denial of service attacks more times than I can account. The last time was Monday. Thanks for inviting me here today, Scott. I'm sure it had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I treat these denial of service attacks like OSHA incidents now. It's been 44 days since my last attack. But they do happen way too often. The FBI called me this year just to inform me that I was under surveillance from China. To which I said, no shit, welcome to the party. <laughs> and I'm not talking about some, some field office or regional office. I'm saying they flew in. I can't tell you where they flew in from, but they flew in and spent two days in my office going through my systems. That was not an easy thing for me to agree to, but in the end, not a hard decision either. Our investigators in China, China nationals, are some of the most honest and moral, brave people you'll ever want to meet, fighting for integrity and justice. And for this, they have been threatened countless times, beaten, run off the road, pistol whipped, arrested, prosecuted for criminal defamation. That's right, criminal defamation. So 
if you say something about a company they don't like, they can put you in jail. And in this case, the offended company was allowed to have their attorney stand with the prosecutor and prosecute this investigator who was given two years in jail. He published nothing. He said nothing. But he worked for an American who did publish. And for that, he got two years in jail. For brevity's sake, I won't tell you about the awful conditions that he had to endure, but they were objectively awful and worse than you can imagine. Kun suffers from PTSD to this day. And we suffer from the decision that put him in that situation. He swears that he has no regrets, but I do have regrets. One of our investigators took it upon himself, so fed up with the police corruption, if you can believe this, to wear a wire and an undercover camera to his own police interrogation where the police were telling him that if he didn't give false testimony against people he worked with, they would make up charges against him. I'm happy to say that we smuggled Michael out of China. And after five long years, just two months ago, Michael was granted asylum here in the United States. In no small part, due to the video we were able to smuggle out with Michael. Now, how does this relate? These companies I'm talking about are inconsequential to the government of China. They mean nothing. And this is what you can go through doing basic due diligence that we take for granted here. Had these been SOEs, state-owned enterprises, we're talking serious jail time, big time trouble. If we were talking about Huawei, that's a game changer. That's freedom over. That's life over. And that doesn't mean, and I'm not saying, that Huawei's a bad company. Not at all. That's saying that's how important Huawei is to China. Hey, there is no looking into Huawei for somebody like us or the average person doing your due diligence in China. That can't happen. That is their national champion. And that's a problem.